Well, if you have a Bible, I'm going to be reading from Romans chapter 5. We spent many weeks in the first 11 verses. We're going to spend one week on the rest of the chapter. I'm going to warn you right now, this is a warning and an encouragement. This is a very theologically dense section of Scripture, and it's easy to get a little bit complicated, and it's because it's involved. So ask the Lord to give you understanding. Also recognize that this passage of Scripture reveals some very important truths. That's why we wouldn't want to dare skip it, even though it's a little bit involved. Hear the words of God. Therefore, this is verse 12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law was in the world, uh, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was the type of him who was to come, speaking of Christ. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's offense many died, much more by the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation, in contrast, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one man, much more those who have received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through the one, Jesus Christ. I want you to notice that from verse 13 to verse 17, that was all a parenthesis. Therefore, back to the main point, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. That would be Adam, affecting all human beings, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, that would be Jesus Christ, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, that would be all all human beings because of Adam, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. That would be all people who trust in him because of what Christ has done. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound to show how sinful sin is. God gave the law, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Hallelujah. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace, which comes through Christ, might reign through righteousness to eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And for as much of that as you were able to follow and comprehend perfectly, let's say amen. 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 The notes are extensive. Don't get bogged down in the notes. If, you, if, it, if keeping up with notes is a problem, put the pen down and just listen. I'm guessing that most of us know that there is currently an American journalist named Evan Gershkovich, who is being held in Russia, charged with being an American spy. I don't know if he's guilty or not. I don't know if he's a spy or not. I don't know the guy, and neither do you. But the charges do look a little flimsy. The whole thing does look, yeah, just a bit political and not really so much criminal. Our government and many private citizens are very angry, demanding his release. However, the man is in Russia, and therefore he is subject to the laws of Russia as enforced by the laws of Russian jurisprudence. It doesn't matter whether we think it's fair or not. It doesn't matter whether we think it's for better or for worse, but the reality is, for better or worse, people are subject to the laws of whatever country they're in. 
Pray for God's will to be done. I didn't bring this up to get political, but I think that it's a, a good launching pad for this passage of Scripture that talks about laws and justice and condemnation and sin and death. And many people, including a fair number of Christians, have a problem with this passage, not just understanding it, but when they do, they don't like it. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But this text that we've read this morning gives us an opportunity to learn about God's law and about God's justice. Let me tell you something about everything about God, but it's true about God's court. God's court is both first and final. No amount of disagreement, no amount of public outcry is going to change God's rulings or change the way God does justice. To many, God's law and justice is patently unfair. If you didn't catch the drift of this through there, all people are sinful because of our father, Adam. That's not fair. I want to be judged for myself. Fine, If even if you were judged for yourself, you'll be condemned because you're a child of Adam and therefore a sinner. Because God is God and we are not, we are wise to understand we are living in his world. He owns this place and he sits at the bench. It's completely ridiculous to argue with God and say he's not fair, that we don't like the way he's doing things. What is there about God's jurisprudence that seems so offensive to us? God judges human beings on a federal system. Don't think federal like the federal government of the United States. Think federal in terms of the, the, the theology of a federal system. This morning we're going to ask and answer four questions. What is a federal system? That's number one. Number two, why do we dislike it? Some details of God's federal system, which will be the exposition of the passage. And lastly, why God's system is such good news for believers. Really good news. So number one, if you're following in your notes, whether you want to write or not, what is a federal system? Okay, let me explain this. Though God deals with individuals individually, now here it is, this is in your notes, God deals with humanity through representatives. He deals with humanity through representatives. The representative is one of us, who is a true human being, who acts for us before God. This passage talks about two federal heads. One is Adam, who is a human being just like us, who when he was the only man on the planet, what he did counts for all of his progeny, all of his offspring, including you, including me. The good news is, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I can't wait because I like good news. The good news, Jesus Christ is also a federal head. He acts on behalf of sinners to bring about forgiveness. All are guilty in Adam. If you don't get anything else, get this. That doesn't mean go to sleep right after this. But if you don't get anything else, get this. All who are in Adam, who is all of humanity, are guilty before God and worthy of his condemnation. All human beings, and that's all human beings, all who are in Christ, and that is not all human beings, but it's all human beings who trust in him. All who are in Christ are saved because of his federal representation of righteousness on our behalf. On ours, meaning Adam, all human beings, those in Christ, all who trust in Christ. It's all in both cases, but the all doesn't include exactly the same group. Why do people dislike this? That's number two on your outline. Why do people dislike it? And here's the simple answer. Because we're all individualists at heart. It's part of our rebellious sin nature. I'll do the thinning around here, Bubba Louie. And if you know what I'm talking about, you're old. Quick drama draw. People don't like the idea, well, why should I be held accountable for Adam's sin? Why did you? Why were you born with blue or brown eyes? You didn't have any say in that either. 
So get over yourself. There's a lot of things that come our way in life that we didn't personally do that we have to live with. Why do we dislike it? Because we're individualists at heart. We don't like someone else determining our fortunes or our fates. We pridefully want to do for ourselves. But since God deals with humanity on a corporate or on a federal system, it doesn't matter whether we like it or not. Again, as you, I put this in your bulletin, in your notes, we may as well learn to relate to God on the basis of his system instead of insisting that he relate to us on the basis of how we wish he would deal with us. He's God, we're not. Just as an American in Russia has to deal with the Russian legal system, we're in God's world, and we'll answer to him based on his system. Now, before going any further with the text, I want to give you some, I'm just going to give you three. I started out with five, but that was too much. Three examples of corporate or federal management in which lots of individuals are subject to the decisions and the actions of someone else who represents them. So if you're jotting down notes, here's number one. Citizens are affected by governments. Citizens don't make decisions in this government. Elected representatives make decisions for us. Whether we voted for them or not, and whether we like their decisions or not. If our representatives, for instance, declare war, we're at war, whether we like it or not, because that's how federal federalism works in this kind of sense. Here's a second one. Students, a little more lighthearted here. Students are affected by administrators. That's number two. Which students agree with every detail of their education or their administration of their education? You know, which student wouldn't say, well, I want less homework, less time in class, more recess, and let's get this thing inverted, turned to right the way it should be. Let's have 10 months of vacation and two months of school. Who wouldn't opt for less homework or more days off? But guess what? Everybody is subject to what someone else is determined in certain areas. Now let's get right down to the very basic building block of the world and of the society in which all people live in. Number three, families are affected by parents. It's the most basic arena, the family, and it's a federal system, or at least it's supposed to be as God designs it. If parents act wisely, I'm just going to give you the Cliff's notes on this. If parents act wisely, their families do better. Would you agree with that? If parents act unwisely, their families do worse. It's just the way it is. Well, I didn't elect my parents to be in charge of me. No, you didn't. What other point that makes no sense are you going to bring up? You didn't ask to be born. I mean, how many of you ran to your room at least once a month as a kid? I didn't ask to be born into this family. People dislike this concept so much that some Christians reject the clear teaching of God's word about the federal headship of Adam and the federal headship of Christ, which have similarities and vast differences in the consequence. Let me conclude this section with two questions. This is kind of, we're still just setting the stage. Who should decide what is just in our courts? Multiple choice. Honest judges or criminals? Don't read into this. I'm not going to get political and say who's running the show now. I'm just saying. How about this? The next step up. Who should decide what is just for all of mankind? Multiple choice. A holy God or a corrupt and sinful mankind? I rest my case. 
Number three, Roman numeral three, some details regarding God's federal system. But wait, I want to give you a warning. Like anything else in God's word, truths can be twisted to become untruths. Cults and false teachers use this passage to support false doctrines. Mormons try to use this passage to prove that Adam and God are one in the same. Blasphemy to the nth degree to say that God is nothing more than a human being who went further. Jehovah's Witnesses argue that Adam's sin condemned only Adam and that we incur no responsibility or even any consequence for Adam's sin. That flies in the face of what we just read from the Word of God. Universalists, people who insist that everybody's going to heaven, try to use this to try to prove that all are saved without reading the rest of even the book of Romans, much less the rest of the Bible. Others misread this text and believe that, we, that all we inherited from Adam is a tendency to sin, but not a sin nature and certainly not any guilt. It's not what it says. And just for fun, one liberal Bible commentator, I'll give you his name, William Barclay. He was brilliant on a lot of things historically, but theologically, he had some holes in his theology. Liberal commentator William Barclay argued that Paul's argument in Romans 5 is, are you ready for this? In quotes, seriously flawed. How can you say you're writing a commentary on the Bible when you're just, you're, what you put out says the Bible is wrong? This was Paul's idea, and he was wrong. It's an easy way to deal with portions in the Bible that are hard to swallow, but it's not the answer to find fault. When, there's, when we have a fault with God's Word, the fault is not in God's Word. The fault is in our understanding. And if we understand it and rebel it, against it, then the fault is our sin. So now, an exposition on the passage. And again, I want to just give you the main point of what this passage is saying, because I don't want you to get bogged down on the details, some of which are pretty involved, but I want you to get the main point, okay? This passage demonstrates that the parallels, the parallels between Adam and Christ exist. Parallels, some are parallel in similarity, and some are parallels in dis, I can't say it, dissimilarity. Differences, that's easier. So verse 12, I'm just going to go through the passage. I'm not going to read the text again. We already did. But if you're looking at your outline, again, don't worry about writing. If it's too much to write, just follow along so that we stay together. Verse 12, sin and death entered the human race through one man. What's his name? Adam. That's simple. As a result of Adam's sin, death spread to all men. Why? Because Adam sinned. And in the text, when it says because all sinned, it is not saying we're condemned because we all sinned. That is a truth, but it's not the truth of the text. The truth of the text is all of the people Adam represented, which is all humanity. All of the people that Adam representative are counted as having sinned because our federal head, the original federal head of the human race, Adam, sinned. It's not referring to the many acts we commit, although those acts are perfectly in order to condemn us, but to the one act of sin, which was Adam's sin, committed way in the past. Now, a little parenthesis here. Some of you have heard of this term, and many Christians don't understand this term, and it's easy to miss because of the words that have been used to describe it. Original sin. I'm not going to ask for hands, but I'm sure many of you have at least heard of the concept of original sin. Original sin, and I've written it there in your notes, is not a reference to the sin that Adam committed, but to the universal consequence of that sin. Original sin is what is applied to all of us because of what he did. It's not just because it was the first sin. 
original sin, the doctrine of original sin speaks about the consequences. And by the way, that means we're condemned not merely because of the guilt inherited from Adam, that is true, but every single one of us have sinned. So arguing whether or not we're guilty because of Adam is, it makes no difference because we're all guilty of our own sins as well. But the reason why we all sin is because all human beings are born not merely with a tendency to sin, but with a nature to sin, the sin nature. Verse 13 and 14 begins a parenthesis, a long one, but don't let that bother you. Even though there was no law to condemn sinners from the time of Adam until the law was given, the fact that all of Adam's descendants died before the law proves that now here's this is in your notes. Even without the law, all of humanity was under the penalty of death because of Adam's sin. That's what he's arguing. The fact that everybody died means sin somehow was perpetual in human beings ever since Adam. Every, that everyone has continued to die since the law was given proves that the law cannot reverse the effect of Adam's sin. The law only points out our sin more specifically. As Paul says elsewhere, I would not have known that covetousness was a sin had God not put it in the Ten Commandments. And stop and think about that just on its own. How many people think it's wrong to covet? Not very many. God puts it in the top ten. It tells you something. That everyone has continued to die does not mean, and to tell the law, does not mean that the law was the only reason why people die. Law cannot reverse the effects of Adam's sin. It only points out man's sin more specifically. And also in verse 4, a little bit of a parenthesis here within a parenthesis, Paul points out that Adam was a type or a foreshadow of Christ who was to come. This is the whole concept of a federal head. Verse 15 through 17. Having said that Adam was a type or is a type of Christ, again, I'm going to say this several times because this is the biggest point. There are similarities between Adam's federal headship and Christ's federal headship, but there are also some glaring differences. Glaring differences. Paul says they are not alike in three ways. See, now I had all these boxes for you to fill in. I thought, I don't want to get people sidetracked in writing, so I filled them all in for you. Who says I don't love you? The, the contrasting two columns, Adam and Jesus, they both, they both acted. Adam acted by giving what the Bible here says, an offense, his sin. Jesus acts in order to give us a gift, which is salvation. There's a verdict for what Adam did and it's condemnation. There's a verdict for what Jesus did and it's justification that can be applied to all who are in Christ. Again, the similarities and the dissimilarities, all who are in Adam is all human beings. All who are in Christ is all who trust in Christ. And so what's the sentence? The sentence of Adam's offense is eternal death. The sentence of of what Jesus did with his gift of justification is eternal life. You see that they're both acting as federal heads, but because their actions were different, the results are completely different. So there's a similarity, the headship, but there's a difference because they acted differently. Adam sinned, Christ never sinned. By the way, folks, listen, I, just, I, I didn't plan to do this, but I'm going to say this anyway. I just read, this is just this morning, in the Christian Post. I shouldn't read the Christian Post on Sunday mornings because it always ends up somehow being in the... Over 50% of Americans who claim to be born again do not believe Jesus was sinless. Listen to me. Read my lips. If Jesus ever sinned, you and I are going to hell. Our only hope is in a Savior who never sinned. If he sinned in any way, he cannot be our Savior. 
This is so vitally important. But see, here's the, di- here's the similarity. Adam and Jesus are both federal heads, but they acted differently, and so the results are different. The number of people involved are also different because the number of people who are in Adam includes everybody. The people who are in Christ includes only those who trust in Christ. But all of those who trust in Christ. Verse 18, judgment came to all those Adam represented. That represented. That's the federalism. That means all in Adam's family, all of the human race. Judgment came to all who are in Adam. Now again, the similarities are strong, but note the contrasting result because of the different acts. So this time we have, instead of columns, we have rows. One row is Jesus, one row is, uh, one row is Adam, one row is Jesus. And again, look at the act, the act. And on Adam's side, an offense. In Christ's side, a righteous act, a perfect sinless life, plus giving his life for those he came to save. There's very important information in verse 18 about the scope. Who's who's getting what? Judgment came to all human beings in Adam. The free gift comes to all human beings who are in Christ. And there's only one way to be in Christ, and that's through faith and what he did for us. The result, for all who are in Adam, condemnation. The result, for all who are in Christ, justification. Being declared righteous, even though in our own practice we're not, because of what our federal head did for us, representing us and giving us the benefits of his sinless life. Verse 19, now some balk here at the words many. Now it gets a little bit involved. Don't get sidetracked. Don't get get worried if this doesn't, as clear as tar. Some balk at the word many and say, aha, sin could not have been imputed to all because after all, not all are saved. And it says many, and it says many. Don't get confused on that. There's two responses to this, and it's in your notes. In verse 18, verse 18 already settled the fact that all in Adam and all in Christ are in view. It's just that all in Adam and all in Christ are not the same people. All in Adam and all in Christ are not exactly the same people. And then the second response to this, well, if everybody must be saved, because if everybody's condemned in Adam, then everybody must be saved in Christ. No, 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 no. Because verse 14 and verse 19 are not given, they're not here to give a final accounting of how many are saved. And this is in your notes. There are, they are intended to show the action of one representative affects many individuals. In Adam's case, all human beings. In Jesus' case, all who put their trust in Christ. That's the difference. Many refers to the issue of federal representation of many people. All re- refers to the scope, and indeed all in Adam are condemned. And indeed, all who are in Christ are justified. It's just that it's not the same group of people. The fact that all human beings are in Adam and only some human beings are in Christ doesn't change the point that in either case, one man represented many. One man represented all who are in him. All of us are in Adam. Only those who trust in Christ are in Christ. Anybody want to stop and take a deep breath? It's a pretty quiet group here tonight, this morning. Seems tonight. Notice that, and again, this is an, I I hesitated to put this in, but I'm going to do it anyway. Don't worry about this if this doesn't seem to make sense, but it's important that Paul used certain words. He says, all who are in Adam were made sinners. All who are in Christ will be made righteous. All who are in Adam were made sinners. It's done. All humanity is sinful before God. All who are in Christ will be made righteous. Folks, listen to me. Christians, listen to me. Right now, as a Christian, you are not righteous. You won't be righteous until you get to heaven. Right now, 
you've been justified, which means you've been declared righteous in spite of the fact that you're not. Now, you go back and look at the text there, and you see the difference. All in Adam were made sinners. All those in Christ will be, in glory, made righteous. Right now, we are, we're walking in the declaration of God's grace, not in some reality of how righteous we are. You are not righteous. I am not righteous. We've been declared righteous because of the grace of God. Just as sure as all who are in Adam are sinners because of what Adam did, all who are in Christ will be righteous because of what Jesus did. Again, the main point is one representative for all who are in him. Verse 20 and 21, see, we're, we're all the way at the end of the chapter. You, know, you think it's easy to preach. I shared in the prayer time before this, I'm, I, was, I still am really anxious about this message because I'm trying to cover some pretty heady stuff that even many people who understand it don't like it. But it's in the Bible. So I hope I'm untangling it a little bit. In verse 20 and 21, another comparison, this time between law and grace. Not just between Adam and Jesus, but between law and grace. The law exposes sin. Grace expels sin in terms of our judgment. The law vilifies man, shows our corruption. Grace glorifies God. Grace glorifies God. And the final results, the law results in what? Death. But grace results in eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Savior. This is what he's talking about in verse 20 and 21. The law was not given to repair, but to expose and to draw attention to mankind's sinful corruption. Which again, why the law? The law was never a means for anyone ever to be saved. Many people think, oh, well, in the Old Testament, they were saved by keeping the law. If that's the case, not one person in the Old Testament is going to be in heaven. No one has ever been justified before a holy God because of the law, because the only thing that the law has the ability to do is point out our error. I wouldn't have known. I mean, I think Paul's much more righteous than me. He said he wouldn't have known covetousness was a sin except for the law. There's a whole lot of things that I wouldn't have known was a sin, except that the law tells me. The law doesn't make us any more sinful any more than turning on a light in a dirty room makes the room dirty. You turn on the light and you just see what it see what it is. The law exposes the dirt that was there all along. Grace does what the law cannot do. The law cannot save. It exposes sin, but grace expels it. Thanks be to God. Grace does what the law cannot do. Roman numeral four, this is the, what difference does any of this make portion of the message? <laughs> uh, you know, some people say, who knew? Some of this stuff people say, who cares? The reason why it matters is because every single person in this room was born in Adam because you're a human being. And he was a federal head for every single one of us. And every single one of us are condemned because we inherited from Adam a sin nature and we act according to that sin nature by sinning and we are condemned. The good news, of course, is that Jesus Christ is a federal head and he represents all who put their trust in him. And instead of condemnation, he brings justification, salvation, and sin is defeated because Christ defeated it. Why is this such good news? I've got four points here. Well, actually, three in a, by the way. If Adam is not the federal representative for mankind, people don't like that idea, then Jesus cannot be the federal representative for the redeemed. And if he is not, we are lost. See, it's fascinating to me that Christians who don't like this kind of doctrine, they like the fact that Jesus can represent us, but they reject the fact that Adam did. They both are true. Verses 12 through 21, Romans 5. 
Here's the second one. If we inherited only a tendency to sin from Adam and are lost, are lost only because of our own sin, then what we receive from Christ is a tendency to be righteous. And salvation is based on what we do with that tendency. Which means salvation would be by what? Our works. Do you realize... I hate doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. This just sounds like I like to bash. I'm not bashing. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that when you're baptized, you are given grace, which is the ability to, to perform good works for which you will be rewarded with eternal life. That's false. That's false. Because even though you say, well, we need Jesus, it's really up to you and your works. Anything that ends up being based on what we do is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is we are all sinful. We are all condemned. There's nothing we can do about it. But Jesus Christ has done everything that needs to be done about it. Number three, if Adam only gave us a bad example to follow, I've heard people say this, if we're lost because we follow Adam's example, then it would follow that Jesus only gave us a good example to follow, and that we're saved by following Jesus' example. Salvation, once again, is then by what? By works. If you are clinging, listen to me, if you are clinging to anything you do, say, think, to get to heaven, you are robbing from Christ the fact that he did everything to get you there and you can't add anything to it. This is the best news of all, especially if we're honest with ourselves. And we know if we're honest with ourselves that every day, even the small sins that we think don't matter would send us to perdition. But Jesus Christ lived and died and rose to get us to heaven. It's based on his performance, not on ours. Otherwise, we're lost. That's why Paul puts this in here. As difficult as sometimes it is to follow. Number four, I put this, the bottom line is this, to reject the concept of federal representation. To reject this concept of federal representation is not only to reject the doctrine of original sin, which is the not, not Adam's sin, remember, but the consequences of Adam's sin that went to all of those who are in Adam, which is every human being. To reject the concept of federal representation is not only to reject the, don, the, con, the doctrine of original sin, but the doctrine of justification based on Christ's death for us. God's Word says that both of these federal heads have impact. Both of them represent many, many, many people. Adam, every person. Jesus, many, many, many people, all who trust in him. We can't trust for our salvation in Christ if we reject the fact that our condemnation comes to all of us in Adam. In a real sense, God has not dealt with the redeemed according to our sins. Is that good news? Praise God, he has dealt with us according to Christ's righteousness. Now, that's the message, but I want to tell you this one last thing. Don't worry about any of this you didn't exactly catch. The first time I heard, first time I read this, the first time I heard this. I, mean, I, can, I can remember hearing it taught, and I'm not going to say by who, but it wasn't very good because it didn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> I don't think that guy was wrong. I just think he didn't explain it very well. Don't worry about what you didn't catch. Look at I realize this is an involved passage. I'm just so proud of all of you whose lids are still up. Just be sure you understand that all people who are in Adam who are all people, all people who are in Adam, which is all people, are justly condemned. 
the gospel makes no difference to people who don't need a savior. We all need a savior. So the gospel is good news for all of humanity. Similarly, but differently, all people who are in Christ, not all people, but all people who trust in him, are redeemed and are therefore not condemned for our sins. He took the penalty for our sins on the cross and he rose for our justification, which means his righteousness is imputed to our spiritual accounts, not on the basis of anything we do. It's all on the basis of what he has done. What's required of us is to believe it, is to have faith in Jesus. Come back next week. I don't have anything further to say on that. Just come back next week. <laughs> don't let this week be go, well, I think that was enough for the rest of this, for the rest of this quarter. But the good news is, is that we took, I don't know how many weeks on the first 11 verses of this chapter, and we did 12 through 21. It was like a fire hose, I know, but we got it, we got it done in one week because I figured if we spread it out over too many, we'll just get further lost, at least if I'm the one who's preaching, and I don't want to do that to you. Let's stand together, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you that Christ has conquered all. We thank you that even though in your jurisprudence all are guilty because of our father, Adam, all who are in Christ have been justified, declared righteous, waiting for glorification when we will be righteous in him. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.